What if you only exist because your ancestors wiped out their cousins? For 250,000 years, humans weren't alone. We shared the planet with a rival, stockier, stronger, and just as intelligent, the Neanderthals. Then suddenly they were gone, leaving us to inherit the Earth. What gave Homo sapiens the edge in the brutal fight for survival? Was it brain power, teamwork, or just luck? On today's episode of The Infographic Show, we're asking why we survived while Neanderthals disappeared forever. Before we talk about how they lived, let's talk about what kind of creatures they really were. Because Neanderthals weren't just smart, they were built like tanks, and they definitely had us beat on durability. The average Neanderthal male was probably about 183 pounds, about 20% heavier than a male Cro-Magnon. This weight difference comes from the fact that their bones were much thicker than ours, sometimes twice as thick in some places, suggesting they were incredibly muscular. Their stocky build not only gave them strength but also resilience, which helped them survive harsh winters and confrontations with Ice Age megafauna they hunted. It took a lot to get a Neanderthal to go down and stay down. At least 79% of Neanderthal specimens show signs of having past traumatic injuries that had completely healed, ranging from broken bones all the way to skull fractures and limb amputation. But Neanderthals didn't load all their stats into strength and constitution. They were also likely excellent sprinters due to their powerful muscles and enormous lungs. However, they wouldn't have made very good endurance runners. Genetic research suggests that the makeup of Neanderthal muscle fibers was much more suited to short bursts of power instead of long-term endurance. Unlike early humans who hunted by sheer endurance, chasing prey until it collapsed from exhaustion, Neanderthals were ambush hunters, preferring to rush their targets and take them head on. But to understand how they got that way, we have to go back hundreds of thousands of years to the Ice Age. This was the era when early humans were spreading out of Africa and into Eurasia. Skulls from this period show their ancestors, Homo heidelbergensis, slowly undergoing Neanderthalization, each generation adapting a little more to the cold, harsh climate. These traits were then amplified by periods of isolation caused by harsh weather. Those isolated groups of Homo heidelbergensis evolved into a distinct species, Homo neanderthalensis. Neanderthals can be differentiated from their human contemporaries, who were called Cro-Magnons, in a few ways. They had broader chests, shorter limbs, and larger heads, with bigger eyes, wider nasal cavities, a pronounced brow ridge, and large, powerful teeth. Their broad chests accommodated their larger lungs, and their bigger nasal cavities acted as built-in humidifiers, which helped them breathe in freezing cold weather. Genetic research done on Neanderthal remains suggests that they probably had similar variations in skin and hair colors that we have. We also know that Neanderthal hair, skin, and nails were likely much thicker than ours. For a long time, people thought Neanderthals were shorter than us, but new research shows they stood about the same height as Cro-Magnon humans. And if you picture them hunched over like apes, forget it. That's just another myth. This myth originated from a single Neanderthal skeleton studied in La Chapelle aux Saints, France back in 1911. The skeleton in question was later revealed to be an elderly Neanderthal possibly afflicted with arthritis, whose aged posture was generalized to the whole species. It would be like discovering the skeleton of a child and then assuming that humans were abnormally small because of it. While the Neanderthals were likely a little less straight than us, they didn't call our predecessors Homo erectus for nothing. They were a lot closer to us than you probably imagine. As for intelligence, recent discoveries point to the idea that they might have been just as smart as we are. That really shoots down the theories of 19th century biologist Ernst Haeckel, who referred to Neanderthals as Homo stupidus. The main reason for this misconception is the fact that Neanderthals had slightly smaller cerebellums than humans. But that doesn't necessarily tell the full story. Neanderthals were using complex stone tools like axes and spears thousands of years before our ancestors arrived in Europe. They made simple garments from animal pelts to keep warm in the winter. They also likely had the tools to make fire, as archaeologists have found evidence of hearths in caves where Neanderthals lived. Evidence found in French caves suggests that they also had methods of smoking and curing meat to store it for later. And that's not the only strange, interesting evidence of Neanderthal intelligence hiding in distant caves. There may have been multiple cases of uniform engravings made with well-designed flint tools. This may not seem like a huge deal, but a group of research scientists looking into the matter would strongly disagree with you. They said of the engravings, the production of the engraving required excellent neuromotor and volitional control, which implies focused attention. 
and we can tell all of this from the lines cut into cave walls 35,000 years ago. If you're wondering about the purpose of those strange markings, it turns out Neanderthals likely had an artistic side. Some specimens show traces of marine fossils, and in 2024, Spanish archaeologists uncovered a collection of shells in a Neanderthal living space. Objects with no clear practical purpose. They could have been a part of a game of some kind, or used as currency, or even just put there because the Neanderthal thought they looked pretty. But all of these possibilities point to a level of abstract thought we didn't previously think they were capable of. There's also plenty of evidence that Neanderthals like to customize their tools, adding bird feathers or bones, not for practicality but for style or maybe even spiritual meaning. Remember some of the Neanderthal injuries we mentioned earlier? Those crazy rates of serious injury also point to Neanderthals being highly social and surprisingly intelligent too. A specimen known as Shanidar 1, discovered in Kurdistan in 1957, showed signs of a missing right arm and severe head trauma, injuries that likely left him blind in one eye and deaf in both ears. Given how severe those injuries are, you'd probably expect that was what killed him, right? New analysis in 2017 showed that those injuries had all completely healed, and despite them, Shanidar 1 lived well into his 40s, which was pretty old back then. Even given how hardy Neanderthals were, there was absolutely no way that Shanidar 1 would have survived that long without help from the other members of his community. This suggests that Neanderthal society was at least organized enough that they could take care of their sick and injured. They also buried their dead with items that may have been symbolic, like flowers and engraved arrowheads. This all points to a complex society on the same level as Cro-Magnons, but strangely enough the jury is still out on whether or not Neanderthals were capable of language as we understand it today. They had a hyoid bone, almost identical to ours, which is an important part of speech. But without knowing what their vocal cords looked like, it's impossible to tell. And Neanderthals weren't just social with other Neanderthals either. There is another mysterious human-like creature from our past, the Denisovans. We don't know a great deal about them, aside from the fact that they mainly lived in the icy caves of Siberia. But studies have shown that some Denisovans coexisted in their caves with Neanderthals, living together, working together, and even interbreeding. So if Neanderthals were as smart as Cro-Magnons and were stronger and more resilient than Cro-Magnons, why aren't they still around today? After all, evolution is about the survival of the fittest, and Neanderthals were pretty fit. How could such a successful species go extinct? Over the decades since Neanderthals were first discovered, there have been lots of theories about why they went extinct. In the early 1900s, when the species was first described by scientists, it was believed that Neanderthals evolved into humans. Back then, they had a much more linear view of how evolution worked, believing that it went in a straight line. Neanderthals descended from apes and humans descended from Neanderthals. Essentially, it was believed that it worked like how evolution works in Pokemon. But as understanding of genetics developed, scientists came to understand that Neanderthals and humans were two distinct species that evolved from a common ancestor. Furthermore, archaeological evidence proved that humans and Neanderthals existed alongside each other for part of the Pleistocene era. Estimated numbers for how long they coexisted range from 2,600 years to 7,000 years. The Cro-Magnon bones and artifacts discovered dating from that period seem to be from the time when Neanderthal populations were starting to dwindle. That led to the next major theory for Neanderthal extinction, that the Cro-Magnons killed them off. Given how battered most Neanderthal skeletons are, it's hard to know how many, if any, were killed by Cro-Magnon weapons. But there's also no proof they didn't fight. But when it comes to any prehistoric human societies, it's hard to tell. Paul Pettit, a paleoanthropologist from Durham University, went as far as to say that while contact obviously did occur from time to time and could have been violent, it was exceptional and certainly nowhere near enough to contribute to the Neanderthal extinction. But even if they never actually went to war, Cro-Magnons could have killed Neanderthals in a much less direct way, through disease. When Cro-Magnons migrated north out of Africa, they probably brought with them a whole host of germs that the local Neanderthals' immune systems didn't know how to deal with. The two species also competed for the same food sources, and in the brutal Ice Age winters, when resources were short, that competition could easily turn deadly. Another running theory for what led to the death of Neanderthals is the same thing that's probably going to kill lots of us – a poor diet. One study into the lifestyles of Neanderthals shows, from the amount of zinc found in their teeth, that they had a mainly carnivorous diet. The more balanced omnivorous diet of the Cro-Magnons, rich in vitamins and carbohydrates, 
kept them healthier and fueled greater physical development, while the Neanderthals fell behind. But it's not just that. Cro-Magnons always had things to eat. Research has shown that Neanderthals got 80-90% to 90 of their protein from prey they hunted down. If prey populations fell due to outside circumstances, whole Neanderthal populations could starve, and this had grisly results. Anthropologists found evidence that Neanderthals may have performed the same butchery they perform on their prey on each other, giving strong support of possible cannibalistic practices. When the Neanderthal genome was sequenced in 2010, this gave us another, more optimistic potential theory as to why Neanderthals went extinct. It turns out modern human and Neanderthal DNA are extremely close, even closer than the 98.7% genetic similarity we have with chimpanzees. The two species were actually close enough to be able to produce viable offspring together, which scientists believe happened frequently enough to result in the majority of people alive today having up to 2% Neanderthal heritage. While many Neanderthal genes are non-coding junk DNA, some still play a big role in our biology today. For instance, the OAS 1, 2, and 3 genes help us fight viral infections. Other holdovers like ASB1 and EXOC6 are linked to being night owls, a trait more common in people of European descent, and one that would have been invaluable during a long, dark Ice Age winter. But along with those very useful genetic traits, Neanderthals also gave us genes that predispose certain people to deep vein thrombosis, clinical depression, and seasonal allergies, so don't thank them too much. Even though, as we explained earlier, Neanderthals were being outcompeted by Cro-Magnons, contact and interbreeding with them would have also been highly beneficial to the Neanderthals. By the time Cro-Magnons reached Eurasia, Neanderthal populations were already dwindling. Small, isolated groups suffered from heavy inbreeding. Their arrival and the possibility of cross-species romance brought something vital to their gene pool – fresh blood. So, it might be possible that Neanderthals didn't entirely die out at all, they just merged with the Cro-Magnon Homo sapiens to create the modern human species. Another factor in why Neanderthals disappeared was climate change. There's a reason we colloquially call the Pleistocene the Ice Age. It was really, really cold. During that era, the Earth cycled between glacial periods, where basically the weather went back and forth from cold to really cold. The period where the Neanderthals were starting to die off coincides with a climate event called the Heinrich H5 event, an extreme, millennia-long cold snap. This is also believed to be a part of what caused the cave bear, cave hyena, and other large mammals to go extinct. Since animals adapted to cold weather already need to burn more energy to keep their body temperatures up, they need to consume a lot of calories. Any changes to the amount of food available can have disastrous effects on the whole food chain. Furthermore, Neanderthals would have been susceptible to extreme temperature drops for another reason. And this is gonna sound weird, but stay with us. The shape of their thumbs. Neanderthal hands and the hands of both Cro-Magnons and modern humans are mostly the same, except for two big differences. Their fingers were stubbier and their thumbs grew out of their hands at a different angle. This for the most part didn't affect their ability to hunt, cook, or use tools but it likely meant that they had a lot less manual dexterity than we do. Finer motor skills like sewing were likely beyond them. This theory is supported by the fact that no awls or sewing needles have ever been found at a Neanderthal dig site. So while they were able to tan animal hides and create blankets and simple ponchos, they were cursed to always be less fashion forward than the Cro-Magnons. At the time, evidence showed that they were using sinew to stitch pieces of hide together into fitted garments which provided better protection from the cold than the loose cloaks that Neanderthals wore. In the end, the Neanderthals probably vanished because of a mix of all of these factors, each one feeding into the next. But all of those problems were made worse by the biggest issue of all, their over-specialization. Neanderthals were strong and hardy to a degree that might seem like a superpower compared to a wimpy modern-day human. But that strength came as a result of being extremely well adapted to one very specific environment. Then, when that environment started to change, those same adaptations were what kept them from leaving. Evidence suggests that Neanderthals were somewhat nomadic, with clans cycling through a few different caves within the same area, but they were nowhere near as capable of the kind of journeys that early humans were capable of. The same stocky bodies and short limbs, which made Neanderthals a perfect sub-Arctic ambush predator, meant that they likely didn't stray beyond their established territories, at least very often. This led to Neanderthal populations becoming extremely isolated from one another, especially during glacial periods. And that's probably why we see so much evidence of inbreeding in Neanderthal DNA. 
Contrast this to Cro-Magnon humans, who evolved for basically the opposite environment as Neanderthals, the African grassland. Since they came from a warmer climate, their bodies used energy more efficiently, their longer limbs, lighter bones, and slimmer build allowed them to not only outrun predators, but also spread out across wider areas to look for water and other resources. Cro-Magnon's ability to essentially just pick a direction and keep walking is what allowed them to make their way into Eurasia and eventually into the Americas via the frozen over Bering Strait. Their greater manual dexterity also meant that they could craft more specialized tools to help them survive in any environment, from clothes to woven baskets, to ranged weapons like spears and slings. They also built seaworthy rafts and boats, spreading as far as Australia, and despite the harsh environment, their descendants are still there 40,000 years later. At the end of the day, Neanderthals didn't die out because they were unsuccessful. For a period of time, they were actually doing pretty well. They died out because they were so perfectly tailored for that period of time that they weren't able to adapt to anything else. If nothing else, the story of the rise and fall of Homo neanderthalensis is one about the dangers of getting too comfortable with the way things are in the present. Never be afraid to change, and always be persistent, even if you make mistakes along the way. Those are the traits that have gotten us humans this far, and if we forget to foster those traits, we might end up going the way of the Neanderthal. Modern humans may have survived while Neanderthals went extinct, but what was life really like for them? Watch what a day in the life of a Neanderthal was like to step back in time and see how our ancient cousins lived, or click on this video instead.